Babiš. Hello, uh, I'm Martin Inček and uh, you can find me on the internet under my last name. Um, and I want to share something about property-based testing, all the things in Serenity OS, or maybe, maybe not all the things, but um, yeah, it's going to be fine. Um, first of all, I want to say I love PBT, uh, to which a reasonable response if we didn't have the previous talk might be what is PBT, uh, but for, uh, for the benefit of people on YouTube, let's, let's go through it. Uh, so uh, PBT is property-based testing. Uh, it's, it might be compared to unit testing where you, know, you have your specific uh, scenario in mind, specific input, uh, specific function under test, and uh, specific outcome. And we, we all know unit tests like this one. And in comparison, property-based tests uh, take the input as an argument and it, it is randomized and you usually um, uh, have many inputs uh, that the function is tested with so that's the main change that uh, the input is received as an argument so our test function will you know get lists like one to three or possibly zero 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 or an empty list whatever just random random values so we test with many random inputs, and uh, that allows us to try various edge cases. And in this, in this sense, uh, property-based tests are basically generating unit tests for you. Uh, once the test finds some failure, some counterexample, it will try to shrink it down to a minimal example. And um, that means value with like no unneeded detail, uh, value which if you simplify it even more, it would start passing the test, which is not what you want. It stops being um, interesting. Uh, and this shrinking is really awesome for debugging because um, often the problem will be really um, obvious just from the structure of the input, just from like what was left there, what couldn't be shrunk down. And uh, it's sometimes really uncanny uh, what the randomized test can find. Um, yeah, so it's just like, this is like surreal experience. You have to um, like experience it yourself, but it's awesome. Um, but this fact that we receive random inputs means that we have to think more generally about the code. Um, we cannot, like, if you if you saw if you saw the previous example, we can't just um, say you know the re reverse list equals something because we have no idea what the input was. So we cannot use equals there. We have to be more general and we have to find um, different properties uh, that are always true no matter what input you get. So it might be um, here. You know, I showed this already. Like, if you reverse a list twice, it will be the same list. Uh, maybe a reverse list can have the same length as the previous list. Uh, if you count number of each value in the list, the counts will be the same. Or maybe if you like walk the original uh, list one way and the reverse list the other way, the values will exactly match, right? So um, those are the properties you could test. And uh, they like, particularly the last one, perhaps like is really minimal in in the sense that you only need that test and not any other test, um, or not not any other property to like fully specify what the sort function should uh, sorry what the reverse function should do. Uh, but yeah, we can you know we can have some redundancy, so it's usually fine to have like whatever properties you can test and like use them all to be more sure about your program. So in summary, you need to find facts that are universally true no matter what the input is. You know, maybe it's laws like commutativity, item potence, maybe you have a previous implementation of uh, what you want to test that you can like compare against, or maybe you, you have a spec, right? And in 
specifications, usually the properties are spelled out, so you can just convert those to code. Okay, so having described property-based tests uh, to you a tiny bit, let's get back to the story. So the story goes, I you know, started using them, I fell in love, uh, I fell in love with you know, letting the computer uh, find tricky edge cases for you, uh, with like seeing some em empirical evidence that my code works the way I expect it to, or maybe that you know, I have forgotten something, right? My mental model was like too simple, and the property-based test will tell me, oh, you actually, you know, what about this example where like, have you tried using zero? Have you tried using an empty list? Stuff like that. And so it really holds you accountable and um, it makes sure to like teach you how your system really works. And so I became involved in some open source tooling for property-based tests. Uh, it started with um, Elm. I, I'm an Elm developer. So we have our own test runner, it has support for property-based tests, uh, but it was implemented in a way that made the monadic bind uh, hard to use, and monadic bind is, it, it lets you decide what generator to use based on a value generated from some previous generator, right? So dynamically choose a different generator. And this is very common and very useful, and it felt wrong that this should somehow be a second level citizen, right? We, so you had this like nice API and suddenly, suddenly for monadic bind you had to like drop down into a lower level API where suddenly you were talking about like shrinkers and this was, this was a hurdle, right? Uh, like why are we making stuff harder to use? Like what is the issue there? Why cannot things be, you know, nice like the rest of the library. Why the weird API? And so while looking into this, I found out that there are three different approaches to property-based testing, uh, three like big families if you like. And um, the original quick check, so um, I will be like comparing them and I'm not trying to like talk down any of these approaches. They are all great, but like they have differences. So. Um, just like, let me like say this criticism with love. Um, so the original quick check, you know, for Haskell and Erlang pioneered the whole industry and um, it, like for its simplicity, it um, has some drawbacks. So um, shrinking works by you providing a function from a value to a list of some simpler values. and there's no good way to get that automatically in a way that would know about the constraints that you made during your generation, right? At least automatically. And so, um, you know, you can, you can auto-generate um, generators and shrinkers, but it works on the type. And so it doesn't know that you did some, some additional thing to the values of the type. So if you imagine, testing values of the form, uh, testing numbers of the form 100x, so like multiples of uh, hundreds, and suddenly, you know, your test comes back and says, this test fails on number five. And like, that's not useful to you, right? Because you only wanted to uh, test the multiples of 100. So five is not in your input space, really. You can't generate five, yet the shrinker got there and presented a value to you. So, uh, to get properly shrunk values, you need to uh, like, you know, make a new type, you need to implement your own like, implementation of the type class, and you need to do stuff manually to get those constraints in there. And it's, in practice, that's a big enough hurdle so that people mostly don't bother, and they will just like, disable shrinking, uh, or like, you know, not write a test, uh, and like, like I think it leads to using the tool less. So that's, I think that's a pity. There's a second approach, Hedgehog, uh, or like integrated uh, shrinking, and um, that one solves that problem. So uh, basically there's an abstraction that, um, you know, you have the, these like combinators with which you build up these 
generators and the shrinkers are built at the same time, right? And so if you map by like multiply this by 100, uh, the shrinkers will know as well. And this works great. This helps, and I think it's like an improvement uh, for the developer experience. But this approach doesn't work that well with monadic bind again. So um, basically, if you if you generate a value, and from that you select which generator to use to generate another value, and you want to shrink that, you cannot go back to shrinking the previous thing. Because if you change the previous thing, you would have to like, you know, throw away whatever you had before and like run the bind uh, callback again. Um, so, yeah, it is improvement in, in the sense that whatever you shrink will always be the value that could have been generated, but um, it is a little bit wonky with monadic bind. It, like, it still shrinks, it just doesn't give you fully shrunk value. It like, stays on some local minima. And so at least that's what the Hedgehog library does. It just like, gives you the best thing it can produce. But the Elm library that I was using, it was like, no, I will not compromise. I will only let you use bind if you tell me how to do my shrinking job in the best way possible, right? Which is like perhaps commendable, but is a bit perfectionist, and it results in the harder to use API. And um, so as a result, people don't bother doing that. So, you know, either, I, either they don't write a test, or they just like wrote the generator, and like said, don't shrink at all. But then, you know, you have the failure and it's like a huge string or like a huge number or like a huge list of stuff and you need to like manually pick out what uh, was important and what's not. So again, a hurdle in the developer experience means that people will not bother. And in my opinion, it's a small miracle that people are testing at all. So why put obstacles in their path, right? And to my amazement, this was, again, almost a miracle. I found there's also a third approach um, used by then only uh, in the Python library hypothesis. Uh, they call it internal shrinking, and it seemed too good to be true uh, because it had autom automatic shrinking, you know, the constraints were there. Um, it works even if you use monadic bind a lot, and it had, you know, simple API. You didn't need to, like, think about shrinkers at all. So this is like, like, I was looking at that and thinking, why doesn't everybody do that already, right? Why didn't everybody jump the train and like did this approach? And I'm like, I need to have this in Elm because I cannot stand this like, this function, like I'm not willing to use it. Um, and so I got in touch with the Elm test maintainers and uh, I implemented it version 2 of Elm test with this new approach. We had to bump the major version because we use semantic versioning and I got rid of the shrinker uh, module, so yep, just major version up. And so I think that's, that's a huge success. And um, I think at the moment this is the best way to implement those property testing libraries because it gives the best developer experience, it, boosts, it, it like minimizes the barrier for the developer to write the test. So that's my story of how I got involved with not just using, but also writing tooling for property-based tests, like the libraries and runners. Now, a change of scene, I have been a long time fan of Serenity OS. Um, if you don't know, Andreas Kling, uh, who is a software developer uh, who has worked on WebKit at uh, Apple and Nokia, he has started writing an operating system from scratch, like you do, naturally. It was this kind of weird 
uh, Mac OS 9 and Windows 2000 and like Unix hybrid. And the aesthetic and ambition and audacity, I guess, like pushed all the right buttons in people and like gave them a nostalgia hit because the project like snowballed and people came and started like fixing things, adding things, uh, and it just got out of control. There's a ton of people working on it now. Um, nowadays, I think they are celebrating their like sixth birthday of the project. Um, and addition to, in addition to all the applications and utilities, utilities they are making in there, uh, it has branched out and they are reading, they are writing a freaking web browser from scratch. And yes, I know what you all are thinking and no, they don't care. They, they, they don't care that it's like crazy project, you know, impossible, you know, you would have to have like thousands of people working on it. No, they just keep writing it. And so this is very inspiring. I love to watch all the like monthly update videos from the, like, uh, from Andres. And uh, I love to like clone the project every now and then, build it, run it, like play around with stuff. It's, it's very inspiring. So, I love PVT. I admire Serenity OS. Hmm. Can I use PVT Serenity OS? So, yeah, I guess. I uh, checked the code base. There were no randomized tests. They only used unit tests. And um, the closest thing I could find was like fuzzing, you know, like AFL coverage guided fuzzing of like, um, you know, like black box binaries and which it's similar but it has a different set of strengths and weaknesses and in my head the conversation went a little bit like this like in my favor I have written property based testing libraries from scratch before not in my favor I have written them in like pure functional libraries uh, sorry pure functional languages and Serenity OS is C++ and I have not really touched C++ since my high school days. And back then, for me, it was glorified C to like get a program that runs in five hours instead of three days, uh, you know, for project Euler and stuff like that, instead of actually trying to find like algorithm, uh, algorithmically better solution. So I know next to zero about like some advanced C++, uh, you know, topics. Uh, you know, templates, L values, R values, references, forwarding, V tables, concepts, like, and so on and so on. Like, it just, am I, like, qualified to write C++ for this project? On the other hand, in my favor, I got really pumped just, like, thinking about all the tests I could write, right? So they have, like, I could just, like, randomly pick a place in the code base and say, oh, okay, like, Let's test you for like round trip. Let's test you with like a model based test. You know, like there's a stack data structure so I can test does it work like linked list or like vector, right? Like all that stuff just like ready for picking, you know, low hanging fruit. So I was practically salivating. Um, but again, not in my favor, <laughs> C. So like would I have to give up my beloved, you know, algebraic data structures? Uh, data types, exhaustive pattern matching, like all that comfort zone of functional programming, would I have to leave it? In any case, I gathered my courage and I went to ask like, would you guys be interested in that? Uh, I asked it in the Serenity OS Discord chat room and I got a green light from Andreas Kring. Uh, so awesome. And like, now what? So. I started out by making an experimental C++, C++ project in a separate repo, you know, outside of Serenity OS, just to explore the space, you know, like, how do I actually, like, compile a project and all that stuff. Um, if I just start porting my existing code to C++, will it work? Will, it, will the C++ somehow, somehow, you know, like, stop me somewhere? Will I need to think of different approaches? Will I be able to solve all these problems? And so CPP mini thesis was found. 
Um, so CPP minifeces a small part of minifeces, which is uh, kind of like a distillation of ideas from hypophysis, right? And both hypophysis and minifeces are written by David uh, R. McIver, uh, author of hypophysis, and it's really, you know, an attempt to show the core idea. And for that reason, it's much easier to test, uh, to port, than um, the real thing, which, is, uh, which has a lot of bells and whistles. And it went pretty well. Um, I managed to port it. I had a basic proof of concept working, just enough to test that my you know, automatic shrinking worked. Uh, notably, I have, I don't know if you will be able to read this, but it doesn't matter. I have kept the Combinator API that I used from L, uh, meaning that this all is technically pure, right? This is just a pure C++ code. I didn't, like, I stayed true to my ideals. Uh, this will be important later. And it worked, like, with STL, with their, like, C++ standard library. Uh, being naive as I was, I thought I have won, you know. This is just the home stretch now. I am almost done. I will just like copy uh, this into the Sanity OS um, repository, just like massage it a little bit, you know, uh, make like a C CLI uh, tool to like expose this, and it will be done, right? Uh, no, that wasn't uh, that wasn't what happened. Uh, definitely not a victory lab, not a home stretch. The thing is, Sanity OS doesn't use STL. Um, Certainty OS does everything from scratch. They use something called AK, uh, which they jokingly pretend not to know the meaning of. Like, is it the agnostic kit, uh, Andrew, Caster, a keyboard? Like, nobody knows. Um, it means whatever you want it to mean. But anyways, it's their homegrown standard library, written from scratch, and it feels quite different from STL, and things didn't really match one-to-one -to, -one to what I try to do in my example repository. Um, like, stuff just randomly broke, um, functions weren't copyable anymore, stuff got destructed before I was able to use it, so I was like reading freed memory, um, you know, I was getting weird crashes, data corruption everywhere, and the whole project has just a lot more like defensive checks, uh, like enabled, you know, they use the like UB set, which is uh, like undefined behavior sanitizer, which is probably good. You know, it makes the code fail faster, so the developer finds the issue, uh, and like it makes for more robust code. But that wasn't really very pleasant for me, the C++ noob who was just like trying to have this code working there, right? And so I started calling for help. Um, I basically set up a camp in their Discord um, and tried getting some help by like posting my error messages and like, would you guys know what to do about that? And oh boy, the error messages. I have never been so thankful for Elm error messages because in C++ for like one error you get like two pages of basically the family tree of like, you have this error in this function that was requested by this function and this function and this function and like this instance of the template or whatever. And so there's just a lot of noise that you have to sift through and find the one line that you can fix. And even if you find it, you sometimes the error talks about stuff that you just like don't understand, or at least I didn't, like deep C++ stuff that doesn't have an equivalent in any of the languages that I used before. And so I really, I really bothered the people in the, the, the Discord, um, and they were very, very helpful. They, you know, helped me with everything, uh, for which I am very thankful. They are awesome. So a very interesting thing happened in the middle of the development. Uh, the API I'm used to from Elm basically puts it, puts uh, the test into two phases into the generation phase and into the testing phase. So in the generation phase, you say what value you want to generate and test, and in the testing phase, you get the value and you, you know, say what you want to do with that. Uh, but if you want to generate in the testing phase, it's too late. 
And um, so you need to like, if you want to generate some other value based on the first value, you need to say it with the monadic bind, right? And I tried to do that in C++, and it wasn't really nice. I think that has to do with like lambdas in C++ being verbose, you know, tuples being verbose. Like, it's just like this happens when you try to write Elm or Haskell in C++. It just isn't pretty. And so it felt like even I wouldn't like to use this. And so I had to try to find some other solution. Uh, and to get rid of this feeling that like this is garbage, I did something I never expected myself to do. I gave in to the dark side. I gave in to the imperative and impure and mutable nature of C++. And instead of like explicitly, you know, having like generator combinators that like hold their own state and everything and having a pure testing phase, I like smashed them together. And the result actually isn't that bad. Like, I know this sounds like, you know, I'm a heretic, but I actually like it. And the impurity isn't that bad. It's still, you know, your impurity is like bounded by this test. So I guess, I guess that's all right. And it's just so nicer to look at and to use. And suddenly you don't need any like map and bind and then flat map, whatever. It's just, this is just nice. And so, you know, much nicer code on the user level. Um, you just run your generators however you want. You test whenever you want. Um, and I think this plays much more to strengths of C++. And so I think that's the takeaway. Like, can you write monads in JavaScript and in Python in C++? Like, yes, you can, but should you? Probably not, right? Um, so, but I think, I think this is a success, like experimenting with like not being so pure, so strict, just like, you know, finding that balance of, okay, this is where it starts being um, like diminishing the returns. Um, I think this was real helpful because I'm trying to sell property-based testing to these people. I'm not trying to sell pure functional programming to them. And so, okay, I had the testing library written. There were still some parts that sucked because C++ doesn't really do much of type inference for like functions. Doesn't matter, if I'm gonna skip that, but um, again, this is like diminishing returns. It kind of works, let's ship it. And so I, finished the pull request and we started having a discussion, right? <laughs> and this took like a few weeks, like every now and then they would like go through the code, generate like five pages of comments, like could you fix this, could, could you like change that? And so this went for a while and in the end, in the end I get the green mark and it turns out, it turns out like 100 comments on a PR is, is the maintenance uh, limit, is the threshold, so you know, they said, okay, this is good enough, you can fix more stuff in uh, the follow-up, follow-up PRs. And so, yeah, this means the library was ready for use, so after losing my hair over, you know, stupid C++ errors, I can now cash it in, I can go do something fun for a change. I, uh, let's write some tests. But where to start? Well, actually, I knew where to start. Uh, I had enough time to think about where to start during this, like, you know, this month of just like uh, feedback on the PR. Um, I needed some proof that this is helpful, right? Uh, and so the first thing I tried is just like an example of property you could have. So of course they do everything from scratch. They have their gzip encoder decoder, so it's the most natural thing to do is to just make a um, round trip test, so you compress uh, random bytes, you decompress them, check that it's the same, but it didn't find any 
it didn't find any failure, so it seems their gzip um, code is fine. But I, I found a different piece of code uh, in their IMAP client, right, for emails. And they had quoted printable encoding. Uh, this is the stuff that you can see in the URL with the like percent stuff, right? So, so equals is like percent 3D or something. And quoted printable encoding has a spec. It has an RFC spec. This is great news. Those things are full of properties. And I was lucky enough to lay my eyes on the section 6.7 rule 3 and now I need some audience participation. You all know the spec by heart. So let's recite with me. No? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Um, well, it talks about you know, tabs and spaces at the end of strings and like how they need to be handled. Like do you uh, like chop them off or do you keep them and stuff like that. So let's see how, oops, let's see how this is handled. So I wrote property-based test. I generated some string. I appended uh, a tab character or a space character in there, ran the decoder, and found an issue. So um, I, I didn't show like the test failure, but I wrote uh, like um, a regression test for it. So you know, if you have um, if you have an exclamation mark and a tabulator, you should end up with just the exclamation mark doesn't happen, right? So this is just like, I was like, am I done? Like, like have I found um, a bug so early? So this was great. So this was first uh, big success for me, finding some bug in the code base. So, but I wanted to show some more, right? I, because after merging the test library, I was the only user of it. So I needed to, make some examples for people to follow. So I started looking at their existing test, like can I generalize their test? And there's a lot, like this is not, not even like 30% of all the test files they have. And so I just started picking some at random. In particular, they have data structures and I started to take a look at the bitmap. And uh, so bitmap is, is just optimized vector of bits or you know booleans. And all the tests, you know, created bitmaps of size of multiple of eight, which is really convenient, like <laughs> suspicious. And so, yeah, obviously I wrote a test that just like doesn't do that at all, right? It just like generates a random number between one and 64, ran it, it immediately found a bug. So the find, the find function that like tries to find the first set bit or unset bit, it just didn't see stuff in the last byte, in the like partial byte at the end, right? And so I went to look into the code. They have size in bytes, which does, you know, division with like ceiling, that's great. But some other code that byte count is division with floor, right? And so the fix was obvious and I had my, you know, Another PR, so that's awesome. Uh, so another fix for like, I guess quite um, like important data structure because this is used for memory management and stuff. So, so that's great. Next time, you know, I, I wrote a bunch of other tests that like didn't find anything, but that's still useful because you know tests are useful even if they don't find bug. Uh, sometimes I have to tell myself that. Next, I looked into complex numbers. I'm going to skip over a bunch of stuff because I uh, am running low on time. But they had one huge unit test that I lovingly called uh, the kitchen sink. It just did a bunch of random stuff just to, like exercise the API. Turns out they missed, they missed uh, a few ways to exercise the API and those didn't even compile. I don't know how C++ code can not compile. Uh, or like, you know, skip type checking, but it did. And so, yeah, again, like a real easy fix, but somehow nobody used that. Somehow it uh, stayed there for a few years uh, in this buggy state. And also they missed, they like switched parameters, which meant that if you did to like one minus C, 
it actually did C minus, C minus 1. And I'm glad I found this because, you know, imagine you are writing some like audio utility and like there's, you know, fast Fourier transforms and like audio buffers and everything and something is broken. And would you guess that complex numbers are at fault? Like it, 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 it almost is like, you know, like the compiler, uh, how they say, like compiler is never wrong, you know, the processor is never wrong, like, but like the, the, the issue is always with your code. But in this case, the issue isn't with your code, it's like with the standard library, right? So I think this would have been tricky to find if you try to find it in some real world application. So that was also really nice. Um, okay, so. I have to catch up with my notes. So this is where I will end with the examples, but it's only scratching the surface. And I think there's enough like stuff to test for everybody. And this is where my call to you comes. Um, like you can you can learn property-based testing. You can practice this like weirdly hard skill of finding properties on a real world code, uh, code base that like there's where there's a high chance of you finding some bugs right sometimes they even say on their discord like oh this code isn't tested enough maybe we could like use those pbt tests there right <laughs> so, and this i was like i'm not doing that right now but i'm like making note of that but you know this, this happens like they could use some people jumping into the project and like writing some tests for them. And so, in summary, property tests are great. I, I love them. Uh, they are huge fun. They find tricky edge cases, tricky examples you wouldn't think of or even couldn't think of, right? Like sequences of like 10, 20 operations after which something breaks. Like you cannot make it up. Um, so I recommend trying out property-based tests making those part of your toolkit, part of your skill set. Secondly, if you are ever in the situation of writing the testing library, steal from hypothesis because they make stuff easy for the test writer, right? And functional C++, I think, I would say it's not a thing. <laughs> it's, it's really hard, right? And so it, it's possible to do it, but maybe you don't need to go the full, like all the way 100% pure. Um, think of the 80-20 principle, you know, diminishing returns. There's, there's a balance to be found. And finally, I want to, like, if you, if you want to get some experience writing property-based tests, Serenity OS is now a great place to do that. You can just like randomly pick a file and start testing some class and you might find a bug. Uh, yeah, so Serenity OS would be very suitable for that. Serenity OS wants you. And, um, you know, the foundations have been built. The property test runner is there. All we need are the tests. So, you know, there are a bunch of utilities, applications. There's like a spreadsheet. There is a paint clone. There's a bunch of data structures that are very easy to write tests for. Um, I can help you, uh, like guide you to like pick this, pick that, or like uh, guide you through the process of like finding a property. Come join the Serenity OS Discord, pick a piece of code to test, and have some fun and make open source projects uh, better in the process. So, yep, yeah, that's my call. Thank you. Inspiring and, and uh, uh, energetic talk. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yeah, so you said like um, the hypothesis was the like idea inspiration because it also got the magic find uh, stuff. Like, how, why would people working at Python care about this one? Because I to get a question. Right. Uh, they use this kind of interesting API where they also have the generation phase and the testing phase, right? And so they need the bind function to basically say what you want to generate. And later it's too late. So they have the same 
limitation that I had with Elm or that like Haskell has. So that's why they even had a notion of like monadic binding. I don't know, do you have a flaw? Or yeah, you... because I mean, there are no monads in, in Python, or is it, is it this, uh, like the yield from stuff that you kind of. Well, there's, there are models in Python, like the, their like generator, or they call it strategy. Uh, it has, you know, like flat map and stuff like that. So you can you can have monads in Python, and they do. And all right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, you so when you show the transformation or the, the journey from uh, ugly functional C++ to uh, now it's imperative C++. I assume that there is a, a tons of macro expansion, global variables, whatever hidden behind this thing on the right. Um, or is it more, or is it a bit principled or is uh, it is I think it's kind of principled so this gen thing only uh, what it does is like when you get the last failure so we don't want to like print stuff out when you um, when you are shrinking right you only want the last shrunk value only the minimal example so this will only add like a print of the last value after after shrinking is done. So all the like impure stuff is actually in this micro, <laughs> in the randomized test case, which like initializes the RNG, like the history of the random bits, which is what's needed for the hypothesis approach. And basically, so this is like the limit of where that impurity goes. And the generators in themselves right into that uh, global state. So, so generators are a little bit impure, but it never goes above the test. I guess my question was, or yeah, maybe a follow-up question is more, couldn't you, or is, I mean, couldn't you just bite the bullet and say, yeah, C++ is imperative, you have variables that mutate, I need a generator which is a state which I need to carry over the world space. And yeah, of course, building a, building an expression doesn't work, but let's just write it. You know, because at the end of the day, a monadic bind is just a way to sequence things. Yes. If you already have sequence things in your language with a semicolon, just yeah, just do it, right? Yeah, yeah. Maybe there is a. Um, I mean, yeah, of course it's cool, but I don't know if, if yeah, I mean, I'm not a serious programmer, but I need to deal with a lot of macros and not making sure what my code expand to it. Running into the issues like you know non-hygienic micros and yeah. things being. Um, yeah. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, again, I'm not a simple programmer. Yeah. So. The the macros are quite minimal. Okay. And. It's more yeah, deferring stuff. Yes, uh, the impurity stuff is mostly in like like one foundational generator that like gets integers, and all the other ones you know for booleans for strings for whatever are built off of that one, and so this one has some complexity where it uh, accesses the global state and no other generator touches that. So yeah, I think, I think the impurity is quite localized and it's, it's like when you say macros it's scary but it's like in this case it's pretty um, constrained. I think it's quite nice. Yeah, Alright, there was one question yeah. in the back. You mentioned a couple of projects. Uh, there's jQuery, which is property-based testing for Java, and uh, test check for closure, which also does yeah. the same. Just to mention that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think test check uses the second approach, uh, yes. like yes. Hedgehog, and jQuery uses the third one, if I'm not mistaken, the hypothesis one. Yes. Uh, test, actually, test check uh, does shrinking as well. You yes. Don't need, uh, the monads, but you can do 